Good morning, I'm John Woodridge, CEO of Bryan Medical Center. Welcome to our press briefing on Tuesday, June the 30th. I have as our guest today, Dr. Ann Perlman, who's an IPA hospitalist who will be speaking to us shortly. I thought I would talk a little bit about our uh, support persons and we've extended our hours for those visitors from 5 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. and that started on Monday. Uh, to give you a little bit of our numbers, our midnight census is 461. We have tested 13,061 uh, uh, individuals and have 1,595 positives. We have four COVID patients in-house, all four from Lancaster County. Only one of those individuals is on the ventilator. We have two of the individuals in ICU and two in our general care unit. We have been experiencing, experiencing delays in some of our uh, tests that are going to the outside lab. Uh, you knew before we were at about a two to three day. We're now seeing as much as a five day turnaround and part of that is just due to the testing that's happening across our country. And we're seeing some of these labs being overloaded with the number of tests. We continue to work with them to tr try to get turnarounds as quickly as we can. And we will continue to do that, but we are calling individuals as soon as we get those results back. So we want people to assure that we have folks that are working those uh, calls constantly as the results do come in. But it's just part of what happens as we see these fluctuations. I think if all of you have been watching the news, you've seen some of these states that have had some pretty high positives uh, occur and a lot of testing is happening uh, in those areas as well. With that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Ann Perlman to come forward and share some information with you. Thanks, John, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, you know, I think we've been relatively lucky in Lancaster County up to this point where the numbers have stayed relatively low, and I think everyone is a little bit tired of hearing about COVID and social distancing. I understand that. Um, but you probably have maybe friends or acquaintances in healthcare, and we keep harping on it, and I just want to explain why we're still worried. What I have on the slide there is Lancaster County data from this week, and you can see that the percent positive tests are at 65 which is concerning because a week ago it was 3.2. So that is an actual rate of positivity. It doesn't matter how many tests we're doing. That just means that more of the tests are turning up, higher proportion of the tests are returning positive. So that's a little bit of a concern for us. Um, the other concern was 65% of the people tested were younger than 40. And the reason we worry about that is what we didn't understand at the beginning of this disease was younger people tend to be asymptomatic but have the ability to spread the infection. And so we have a lot more people now living among us who may have the infection and have no idea that they have it. Um, so that, that's our big concern from a healthcare standpoint. If you remember back just a few months ago when New York City had their horrible outbreak, um, what is thought to have happened is that there was spread of COVID in the East Coast months before we actually realized it. And a lot of that was probably travelers coming back from Europe. As you can imagine, people who do international travel are younger and healthier and probably more likely to spread it asymptomatically, meaning they had no way to know they had it, but the infection was spreading through the community. So there was a slow simmer of infection that then eventually made its way to high-risk people, and that's when you saw the hospitalization rates go so high. So what we're worried about in Lancaster County and other places is we have a kind of similar simmer of cases in young people who are not requiring medical care currently, but that infection with time will risk our high, reach our high-risk individuals. So can we do anything about this? Yes, luckily. Um, masking, I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing about it. Yes, it's become political, which is just heartbreaking to those of us in healthcare because we don't think of this as political at all. If anything, we think of this as kind of a war effort. Our country's at war against this virus. What can we as individuals do? You know, in World War II, we did victory gardens. This time, masking. Um, the main purpose of a mask is to prevent you from infecting someone else. So when you wear a mask out to the grocery store, it's not saying to anyone that you're nervous or scared or whatever. It's the most altruistic, patriotic thing you can do right now is to put on a mask. What it's saying is, in case I have an infection and I don't know it, 
I don't want to give it to the cashier who may take it home to her mother who may end up sick and, you know, in an ICU. Um, there is a smaller benefit in protecting yourself from an infection if you have a mask on. The reason being is, yes, none of, we're not talking about N95 masks that block out all particles, and we also know that the infection can be acquired through the eyes in addition to the nose and mouth. So the reason for a mask wearing it, it prevents you when you're talking from, a limit, from sending out virus particles in saliva or nasal secretions. Um, I think some of the suspicion around this on social media or conspiracy theories about masking has come from the fact that the initial recommendations from the CDC were confusing, and they were, and some of them were wrong. Um, the reason for that initially was, yes, there was a PPE shortage, and so I think we were trying to conserve masks for healthcare workers. Um, but the other reason is, at that time, we didn't understand this high risk of asymptomatic transmission. This is not something that we've seen in my lifetime in terms of influenza and other illnesses where people can go for 10 days, never have symptoms, and spread the virus. And we now know that any kind of face covering greatly reduces that risk. Um, we're going to show you a video now that kind of illustrates why masking prevents you from spreading the infection to others. Now I'm recording. Stay healthy. Great. Stay healthy. Great. Less loud. Stay healthy. Are you recording? Yeah. Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. Nothing. Just a few mask myths that I've seen on my Facebook feed and I'm sure you guys have seen as well. Um, the first concern is that a mask could make you sick from germs or somehow needs to be kept clean. I've seen a lot of comments that People are naive and they wear masks and then they touch them with their dirty hands and they're just making themselves more sick. Um, there's no scientific basis to any of that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, we're not talking about maintaining a sterile field for surgery. There's nothing about this that is sterile. The mask is a physical barrier to catch your saliva and your nasal secretions when you're talking, coughing, sneezing. It's not sterile. It's full of your own germs. You can't catch anything from yourself. So yes, it's good to wash it every few days, just like you wash your clothes. Um, because otherwise it's kind of gross, but it won't make you sick. And you don't have to have sterile hands when you take it off. Of course, if you've been out, you want to wash your hands, but there's nothing about that, this that can be equated to how we handle masks, for example, in an operating room. Um, the second myth is that a mask could make you sick from low oxygen or high carbon dioxide levels. Again, there's zero scientific basis to that at all. Um, we've been wearing them in healthcare for years and years. Um, surgeons and operating room nurses wear them basically their entire careers um, and their sharpest tacks, I'll tell you. When I talk to a senior operating room nurse and get in an argument, you'll probably lose. Their brains work great. They're super smart. There's no issues with that whatsoever. Um, in healthcare, we've been wearing them for our entire shifts uh, now since March, um, and we all feel fine. So that's just silly. Um, in terms of COVID myths, a lot of people say, quoting kind of the relatively low mortality rate, um, that it's just a bad flu. Um, I'll tell you, I've worked in a hospital for 19 years. I've never seen anything like this. My physician colleagues and nursing colleagues have never seen anything like this. It's really scary. It has us scared. We've been able to keep the mortality rate low, I think, to some degree, especially in Lincoln, because we haven't been inundated with numbers. Um, but these patients are so sick. They require so much intensive care. If we get overwhelmed, like what happened in New York City, we can't maintain this perfect level of ICU care across that many people. The mortality rate will go up. Um, I've had healthy men in their 40s come in that look great. They're just on a little oxygen. That with influenza, I could predict that course. They may be here for a few days and then go home. Two of these gentlemen, within two hours of arriving, were on a ventilator. Um, People develop their, their kidneys shut down, so kidney failure. We've had patients have strokes. We've had a lot of patients have heart attacks, blood clots to the lung. All this is related to the COVID virus. We don't understand the whole thing. It's a brand new virus. None of us in our lifetimes have treated it. We have no long-term data, but it's scary. We can't predict who gets sick and who has a mild case. Um, you don't want to get it. It's not the flu. My last slide, just to bring this home, hopefully a little more personally, this is um, gifts 
that a patient of mine, his grandkids made for him. So hopefully you can see on that card it says Papa. That's their name for their grandpa. Um, he has COVID. He wasn't engaging in high-risk behaviors. He simply went on a car ride with a friend who ended up having it. Uh, but he has become very ill. This is his 14th day of ICU care here at Bryan. Um, you know, this is heartbreaking for this family. This is a really fun, active guy. He coaches his grandkids' sports teams. Um, he's had complications. It hasn't been a smooth course. Um, he, you know, he would do anything in hindsight to not have this. Um, this is here in Lincoln. This could be someone any of us know. This could be any of our relative. This could be ourselves. So I urge you to please continue to mask and practice social distancing. And if you are a young person or you have young people in your lives, like I have three teenagers, the social distancing is key right now. The virus is out there and it's spreading. So please be careful. Thank you. Right now, the testing recommendations are if you have symptoms that you think could be COVID, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of smell or taste, um, diarrhea, we've had a few people, you know, there's a wide range of symptoms. If you're at all suspicious, then you should get tested. Also, if you've been in close contact with someone who has COVID, and so close contact would be an inside contact for more than 15 minutes would be a good gauge. In those situations, you should get tested. In terms of retesting, um, there isn't great recommendations. Um, obviously, the test only tells you you're negative in the moment that you have the test. So if you get a test and you're negative, but you leave and you go hang out at your friend's house and they have COVID, you could be positive four hours later or at least developing the infection. Um, so I think you know it's important to get tested based on if you are symptomatic or you've been exposed. Other than that, put all your energy into just acting like you have it. So meaning if you feel fine, but you're going out in public, wear a mask. Don't go to indoor social events. If you want to socialize, that's great. It's summer. Do it outside. Stay six feet apart. You know, be safe. You know, I can say our people in the hospital that have had COVID for a prolonged period of time, we do repeat tests to see if we can take them out of isolation and their nasal swab eventually returns negative. So presumably, if you had COVID, eventually you'll swab negative. What we don't know is if that confers lifelong immunity or even short-term immunity. Um, we just don't have the answers to that yet.